Well, to the end of the day, we've saved the best to last. I'm sure it's been a long day for everybody, including myself, thirsty. Who else in the audience is thirsty? Who wants a beer? Raise your hand. One, you in the blue shirt, up you get. One more guess. You, grab a beer. Blue, grab a beer. How many left, Steve? Two. On the back. White shirt. I think we're pretty much out of, out of beers. Three more. There you go. Blue shirt. That's it, we're done. All the beers are gone, unfortunately. Probably the best advertising campaigns in the world. Synonymous with some of the most iconic brands of our recent times. Our next speaker will give an insight into what makes their brand, without question, not probably, one of the best brands in the world. Please give a very loud Web Summit welcome to Carlsberg's Chief Commercial Officer, Jessica Spence. Good afternoon. Um, I'm now feeling really jealous of the people who have beer. It's sort of got to that stage and I've been thinking about beer for the last couple of hours quite intensively. And there's nothing I want more right now than a lovely cold Carlsberg. So for those of you who've got them, please enjoy. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about now is a difficult topic because I think starting off to talk about probably the best anything is normally setting yourself up for massive failure. So I'm not necessarily going to talk to you about the absolute best. I'm going to talk to you about the journey that we've been on as a very famous advertiser for many years, but an advertiser who's had to learn to do things differently and who's had to learn how to change. Where do we start from? Probably. Probably the best beer in the world. It's one of the most famous advertising lines there are, and we've been using it now for decades. We're one of those lucky brands who've been able to hit on a line that seemed to resonate and resonates globally. We use this across the world and everywhere it's loved, it's understood, but more importantly, it's picked up. It's become part of the vernacular. Consumers use it, they borrow it, they use it to describe their lives, things they love, things they hate. When I got this job, the most common posting I got to congratulate me was saying, probably the best job in the world. And pretty much it is. Um, it probably has become so iconic for us that actually we found we can use this by itself. So people see this, you automatically cue Carlsberg. We have examples of where we've used just the word probably in advertising with no branding at all and we've often actually exceeded other brands in terms of brand awareness because this just resonates so strongly. In France, where we advertised at the Euro, we were on the perimeter boards in the football stadiums and all we, all we showed was probably. We had the second highest brand awareness coming out of that. Every other brand, McDonald's, Coke, everyone else, they were using their full logo. We just were able to put this word up and it got you there. So this is a wonderful position to be in. We're, we're very excited, we're very happy about this. There was just one problem, and that was when we started talking to consumers about four years ago. And unfortunately, this is what they said. This is an extremely common view, and actually, uh, to be honest, even within my own family, my brother has said this to me. It's like, really fantastic advertising, love watching it, never gonna buy it. Which, as the chief commercial officer, so I look after marketing and sales, is a little challenging. Ultimately, I love the advertising, but I do kind of want to sell some beer as well. Um, and we really needed to unpick this and say, well, what's going on here? We've been producing these wonderful adverts that are iconic, that are famous, that people talk about. It just doesn't seem to be necessarily resulting in what we're aiming for. And um, I think there were three things, really, we discovered about what we needed to maybe do differently. I think the first one is honestly, we had become masters of what I would slightly provocatively call a dying art. We were phenomenal at 30 and 60 second TV commercials. 
You know, that was absolutely baked into the being of the company. That was who we were. We thought of each year in terms of what is the story this year? What is the ad this year? What's our hero film? And all the markets waited for it. We sweated, we did endless testing, we spent a lot of money and out plopped a beautiful piece of advertising, hopefully. That was the way we were organized. You know? um, we were experts at that one thing. And the problem was that one thing just wasn't cutting it anymore. We were masters of something which, yes, still has a role to play, but is a very, very small part of what your total marketing mix needs to be about. I think the other problem was honestly, though, that we'd also lost a sense of authenticity. Actually, one of the beautiful things about our advertising was it allowed us to talk about a huge range of things. We talked about football and flatmates and girls and all sorts of wonderful things. We didn't really talk about the beer very much. Didn't really talk about where we were from. Didn't talk about what the beer tasted like. And I think for a long time, people thought in a category like beer, well, that's fine. You know, beers, are they really that different? Surely it's just about emotions, doesn't really matter. And I think we'd actually spent a long time talking about everything but the product. And that was happening at a time when, as I'm sure many of you know, authenticity, the quality of the product, the desire to know more about the product has become a huge driver for consumers. But for some reason, we sort of had thought we were exempt. So I think we lacked that authenticity. So we had a lot of, lot of very hard discussions internally. And the first thing we did was we went back to the roots. We went back to our founder. Bit, brief bit of history, this is a man called JC Jacobson. I spend a lot of my time thinking about him. He founded the company in the mid 19th century. And he had a very noble vision for what we were meant to be about, which was we were meant to be about phenomenal quality beer. He believed that the Carlsberg Brewery should be a model for other breweries. It should be perfection in brewing. And he believed that brewing, the art of brewing, was something which was honorable, it was scientific. He founded the first ever laboratory of beer, still exists to this day, 150 years old, the only one of its sort in the world. And when we looked at this, we really had to ask ourselves, are we living up to what he wanted? And have we gone too far away from actually what our roots were? And I think we felt we had. And we talked a lot about, well, what is probably in this context? What would Jacobson have made of probably the best beer in the world? What would that have meant to him? And we said it would have meant two things. Jacobson would have said probably, partly because he's Danish. The Danish, if any of you are here who are Danish, as you know, are a phenomenal country but also with a sense of humility, a sense of understatement. He would never have said the best. He's the polar opposite of Trump. But also, I think when you look at Jacobson and you read what he did, what he drove in the organization that he had at the time was a constant sense of innovation. He was an experimenter. He did new stuff. He tried things the whole time. He drove his team mad, but he was constantly saying, there's always something better. There's always the next stage. There's always something that can be improved. And that was where we kind of got to on probably. We said, well, actually, if we're going to be true to this, if we're going to be really true to the brand and be authentic, we need to find a way of telling that story, of trying to be constantly better, of trying to constantly push ourselves and drive ourselves to be the best, recognizing you're never quite going to get there. There's always going to be tomorrow. There's always going to be something new. There's always going to be something you can prove. So that was the first thing we did. And as a team, we set ourselves one job. I'm a big fan of brand teams having one job. It simplifies a lot of things. And the only job we had is we said, you have to substantiate why are we probably the best beer in the world? That's all we have to do. Make that statement real again. Make it live, make it credible, make people believe it. And that was basically the start point. And at that moment, I think a few things changed in our mindset. I'm going to show you three things that we did, and then I'll talk a little bit after that about what I think we learned from it. This is the first one. Um, I will show you the film of this first. Now, this was an internal film we made, so the first thing to say is apologies for the acting. This was never meant to be external. You will notice that the scientists we feature in this are wonderful, 
but probably not going to be up for an Oscar anytime soon. But it does show you a little bit of what the story was about. This project all started when our museum found a rare bottle of beer from the late 1800 in the old cellar below the brewery. This is it. And we were allowed to take a sample from it. No one believed it was possible. And to everyone's surprise, we actually succeeded in isolating live brewing yeast from this old bottle. Got really good news, we found the yeast in the bottle. And that gave us this completely unique opportunity to rebrew the first quality lager in the world. If it wasn't for the contents of that old beer bottle, we wouldn't have the consistent, excellent lager beers that we have today. And the rebrewing project is incredibly exciting. This project is for sure going to be a big challenge because we want to do it the authentic way. It is possible, but nothing should go wrong. Exactly, we only have one shot. If this goes wrong, we cannot redo it. We have only one batch of raw materials. The yeast that we collected and recultivated from the old bottle is from the time 1883 where the method of purifying yeast was developed and it all happened here at the old laboratories of Carlsberg. One of the most important advances ever in the history of beer science. Without it, we wouldn't have uh, a type of beer that is now 90% of the world's market. But instead of patenting this discovery, Carlsberg's founder Jakobsen gave away the purified yeast to everybody. Here we got a letter from a grateful Dutch brewer. He writes, we are very grateful for the initiatives of the Carlsberg Laboratory. And he ends up saying, your friendly offer to send me yeast again, I accept with gratitude. Being able to go into the archive at Carlsberg and recreate that original beer is very exciting. And I can't wait to taste it. I love the idea that you can go back and reproduce something that your great grandparents Drinking. I really look forward to, to get a sip of history, to actually have this beer in my glass and go back in time. So, thanks. that was one of the first things we did when we were talking about, well, how do we substantiate? I mean, hopefully you got a little bit of the story. Carlsberg created the first pure yeast that enables the lagers that we know today. And this was what we talked about internally as the Jurassic Park of beer. Um, they make it look easy, but there was a lot of panicked moments during that experiment. Um, and there was a lot of moments when we were terrified it would taste awful, which we couldn't really control. We knew what the recipe was, but we had no idea what it was gonna taste like when we were finished. Thankfully, it tasted wonderful. Um, and we launched that with no advertising campaign with no 30-second TV ad, with a series of tastings. Um, we sent the, all of the bottles we had out across the world, and we allowed people to sign up to be able to be part of that and to taste that very original, very limited batch of beer, and then let it spread. And I think this was the first time we'd done something that we really didn't know whether it was going to work or not. Um, you know, the 30-second TV ads felt pretty safe. We knew that they worked, maybe not always brilliantly, but we had a pretty good sense. When I first presented this to the markets, none of them wanted to do it. Everyone said, no, not with our money. Um, so we had to sort of squirrel and find some to be able to make this happen and do it under the radar. But once we did, it exploded. The coverage we got, the engagement we got from this was phenomenal. We'd never seen anything like it. The second one is also very much on the beer, but on a bit of a different angle. We, as you probably all know, are very close to football. We have a long-standing relationship with the Liverpool team, 25 years. Sadly, not a great night last night, but we're dealing with it. But this is a very close relationship. And again, when we looked at this, we said, OK, well, if we're trying to substantiate probably the best beer in the world versus just plaster our logo around perimeter boards and talk about football, and what you do sitting down the pub watching it, what would we do? So this is what we did. So we're making a beer to celebrate 25 years with Liverpool. It's an experiment where we expose hops to picture and sound from Liverpool games. 
So these plants are more or less just one month old. So they're growing 10, 15 centimeters per day. We use the soil from Anfield. So there's soil in the bottom of, of this pot from Anfield. Really? Com composted soil. Unbelievable. Plants, they're affected by light, but some scientists now believe it's plausible they're affected by sounds, vibrations, and other energies. To create a special beer, we're directly affecting the hop plants so they'll have the history of Liverpool within their cells. I believe in atmosphere, okay? So, and I, I'm really sure, 100% sure, the atmosphere really has a in, big influence on, on performance. You know, to, to feel that support and that noise and passion behind you when you're out there performing, the fans make me feel invincible. Fowler, let it run on to McManaman! I think it's fine when you score goals, isn't it? But if you don't win the game, it's um, less so. If you leave Anfield at five o'clock and you've won the game, you know how happy everybody is. Well, it makes, you said before, it makes everyone's weekend. Uh, which is why you're so disappointed if you ever lose. If the conditions are insufficient, the plant will end up dying. So, yeah, a group of hops who grew up and their whole lives was Liverpool. Um, they were beautiful hops. I got the first batch on my desk and ate one of them. Um, and they were very lovely. Um, and they did all have You'll Never Walk Alone played to them for about the last three days. Um, but again, it was a completely different way of coming at a campaign. Historically, we would have done a 30-second TV ad about football, maybe with some of the Liverpool players. But what we did here was we actually did something. We kept coming back to that idea of how do you substantiate? How do you make it real? And then don't worry about how you tell the story quite as much because the story will spread. The story will take fire and let that happen. Support it, push it, but do something that is worth talking about rather than just saying it. Then the last one very quickly, this is, this is very new. We launched this about a month ago now. Um, first, uh, really massive innovation, I think, in multi-packs in the canning world. Don't know if you can make out what this is, but basically the following probably explains it. This is a multi-pack. We've stripped all the plastic off it. So massive reduction. And it's all held together with very, very small pieces of glue. That enables us, as it says, 60 million plastic bags just in one year, taken out of the supply chain. And this is a whole um, range of what we're calling betterments that we're bringing out. We've got the snap pack, we've lightweighted the bottle, so you can transport it with lower CO2 impact. We've actually changed the ink that we're using on the label. Small, weird fact, slightly geeky, but actually green ink is one of the most difficult to recycle because of some of the metals that need to be used in producing it. So what we've looked at here is how do we get the greenest green ink, an ink that enables recycling, that enables us to actually ensure that from a sustainability perspective, this is the best possible pack we know how to do today. And that we launched and got phenomenal coverage. 
as you can imagine. Again, no TV ad, but just telling the story, doing something that was worth talking about. And our calculation after four days of when we launched this was that for every pound or euro that we had spent on marketing, we had actually gained 20 in four days from engagement, from sharing, um, and from uh, yeah, uh, other people's media. So a, an absolutely phenomenal return on investment, and we're still tracking this. This story, again, has spread globally. We've pushed it, we've jumped on it, um, but a phenomenal example. I'll just quickly go. So I just wanted to talk about, with those three, what are some of the things that I guess we've learned? Um, the first one sounds very obvious, but I think is always worth repeating, which is authenticity in your brand and that clarity of purpose, that one job, is absolutely critical. If you don't have that, whether you're doing TV advertising or whether you're doing anything else, you're probably lost. But I think actually, particularly when you move away from TV advertising, that incredible clarity on where you come from, who you are, and how you make that relevant to today's audience, is absolutely critical. So that step for us of going back to JC Jacobson, of thinking about his mindset, and of trying to challenge ourselves to say, what would he have been doing today? And how do we use that to substantiate probably the best beer in the world, was an absolutely vital stage. And without that, I don't think we could have done anything else. The second thing I think we really learned is, I think historically, a lot of people used brand ideas as a jumping off point for their creative agency. You wrote your brand idea to be able to brief somebody externally to tell your brand story for you. What we found is a brand idea is most powerful when it works as internal fuel, when it gets your teams up and doing things and excited and motivated and engaged and inspired. Because actually, just telling people is not as powerful as doing. And to substantiate, we needed to do and all of those three ideas that I showed you didn't come from briefing agencies, didn't come from you know, big, expensive ad campaigns. They came from people within the team, whether it was in the research laboratory, within the development team, or in the brand team, coming up with, well, what if we tried this? I know it sounds a bit odd, but what if we tried something different? What about this idea? And that's what I've really seen be the big shift in the team is rather than being a team who focused on briefing externally to get great ideas and great creativity, they are now seeing themselves as the people who have to be creating the news, creating the acts, creating the stories that we then ask agencies to help us with. Um, and I think that's been phenomenally powerful and phenomenally motivating. Now, I'm sure you can imagine working on these projects is hugely more engaging and exciting than working on producing a 30-second TV ad. So I think the team engagement as well has really skyrocketed. And then I think the last one is, um, I'm calling it experiment seed and scale. I think you have to be willing to take some risks. You know, all of these ideas, I, I hope you, you liked them. But you can sort of imagine what my response was the first time somebody turned up in my office and said, we're going to build a greenhouse. We're going to put some hops in it. And then we're going to play four months' worth of Liverpool games at them. It's going to be great. Now, I like to think that I'm open-minded. But to be honest, that wasn't an obvious sell. Um, it sounded a bit weird. I was really not convinced anyone initially was going to care about a bunch of hops watching football. Um, but they did. And I think what was important for me, and actually for all of the leadership as well, was to learn to let people just try some things. There's a whole load of other experiments we did with the same spirit, the same mind mindset behind them, which didn't work. I'm not going to show you all of those. But there's plenty that didn't. But the ones that did, when you see them, and when you start seeing that traction, you get behind it. And you get behind it fast, in a very dynamic way. And that, again, is very difficult for an organization to get its head around. It's much easier to sell somebody, here's the advertising, here's the six-month media plan, it's all going to be good. It's much harder to have to go into the executive committee and say, you know, the hops in the greenhouse are kind of going crazy, can you give me an extra couple of million to get behind it? But that's what you have to be able to do. 
you have to be able to go in and be dynamic to think completely differently about your budgeting process, about the way you can plan, and about what you are able to foresee. So once you've got that clarity of idea, let people play with it. Let people have fun. Let people experiment. And then when you see something getting just taking off, you see that sense of fire, get behind it with all of your will, all of your budget, and drive it, because you've got something magic there to work with. So it's been a very big journey for us. I think we've come a long way. I don't know if we will ever say that we're doing the best. We, we hope probably we've made a really big step forward. I think the brand is looking very different. And I think for us as a team, it's now an incredibly powerful brand to work on. So I think is why genuinely I would say this is probably the best job in the world. And I hope it continues to be. And I hope you've enjoyed what I've shared with you today.